So we're talking about uh, um, kind of the trade-off between randomness and memory. And the emphasis is about uh, recent progress. I have the feeling that I'm very loud or, or it's still okay? Okay, good. Okay, good. Um, okay, so, and that sits within the more general question of the power of randomness. And we have a complicated relationship with randomness. There are times in which we know that randomness is necessary. For example, in distributed computing, we know that there will be lots of uh, starving philosophers without randomness. And in general, kind of breaking symmetry. In cryptography, we can't even uh, define what we want without randomness. It's not only achieving it, it's just even defining it without randomness. Definitely doesn't make sense to do sampling simulations without randomness. In other cases, it's very powerful. Communication complexity, of course. Uh, one of my favorite examples, there's tons of examples. One of my favorite is uh, conge congestion in routing, the valiant kind of idea of uh, sending your package to a random place and then to where you want it, which is a beautiful result. So there are lots of places where either we have to use randomness or it can save a huge amount turning us from exponential to constant. Um, and then we are in the place where we're wondering if we need it at all. Kind of like in a relationship. Uh, so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Can we cut this part? Of the, okay, sorry. <laughs> Nobody is going to watch it, so that's okay. Um, and that's when we are, we are just a single party trying to compute a single thing, so kind of in algorithms. Do we need randomness in algorithms? And this gives us two major questions in complexity, which is uh, the BPP versus P and the RL versus L. So in BPP versus P, we ask, does randomness help to save time? In RL versus L, we ask, does randomness help to save memory? In time, we're asking, does it save time beyond some polynomial uh, uh, um, factors? In RL, we're asking, does it save memory beyond a constant, a multiplicative constant? More specifically, uh, we can ask this question in kind of the lower, lowest complexity, and it will carry through. And this is where the randomized log space is equal to deterministic log space. And sometimes we'll talk about BPL, which is the two-sided error version of randomized log space. And this is the focus of this talk, the, ra the randomness versus memory. And we, we are interested in this question, but we're also interested even in, ta in places where we know how to, uh, how to do things deterministically, we're also interested in a particular artifact, which is pseudorandom generators. So we really care about pseudorandom generators that fool log space computations, and I'll say something about it. So this is what we are asking. Can we save memory with randomness? And can we construct through the random generators that full random log space computation? And, and the theme I like to focus on is that, that there is, for this question, there are many frontiers. We can all, everybody in this room can work on independent directions towards resolving these questions. And we'll see a few of those here. So many frontiers. And today we're going to focus on three recent threads. So in the first one, we're going to, to talk about hitting set generators. I'll explain what I mean. 
uh, and actually even a bit more, so I'll call it heating set generators plus plus, where the dependence on the error parameter, how close do you want to fool uh, the, the object of computation is good. So with good dependence on error. In the second one, I'll talk about the approach towards RL equals L uh, through kind of viewing things as a connectivity on graphs or a graph perspective on this study, kind of connectivity and beyond connectivity. And specifically here, we'll talk about things for the undirected graph kind of case. So undirected graphs beyond connectivity. And the third and last thread, we're going to talk about two different questions that perhaps somewhat surprisingly turn out to be extremely related, which is pseudo-random generators for constant width computation. So this is, think about it as the version when you don't have even logarithmic amount of memory, but essentially you have constant amount of memory. We'll formalize that. So for constant width uh, branching programs. But also we'll talk about pseudo-random generators where the computation can decide to read the bits in arbitrary order. So also against arbitrary order. And this will be the focus, kind of the three threads that I'm going to pursue. But I will try, I will start with kind of more general context, uh, both to kind of set up all of these questions in a more formal way, and actually to, to, to explain why are we enthusiastic or happy about any of these results. Uh, and also because when we want to pursue this question, this general question, we shouldn't focus on the last thing that happened. Uh, this kind of is the gift that keep on giving. There have been decades of beautiful results in this area. And, and with aging, uh, I have an uh, inherent interest in promoting all of this, uh, <laughs> all of this line of research. Uh, okay. So let's talk about, I mentioned already branching programs, which is the kind of model of computation that we want to, uh, to fool and can be thought, thought of as the non-uniform version of small memory computation. So in, a, in an ordered reads once branching programs, and often I will just say branching programs because of laziness. Uh, we have layers of nodes. We have so layers of vertices. Uh, the width of the computation is a parameter that we will refer to as W for width, the number of nodes in each layers. The number of layers is the length, and we'll denote it by N. And each node is 
is connected to the next layer with two edges, one labeled zero, one labeled one. We can think of higher arity, larger arity, and it makes sense at some point, but we won't do it this, uh, we won't do it here. We have a start vertex S and an accept vertex T at the, at the end. And, um, and essentially a computation, so you think that this branching program reads its input, uh, and when it reads its input, it just goes on, this, uh, on these layers. So who, for, who already saw this model before? Or, okay, so I can be brief. I think that it's, it's pretty common. Uh, right. So, right, so, so a path is, you read zero, you go here, then you read one, you go here, and so on, and the question is you accept if you reach from the start vertex to the accept vertex, otherwise you reject. And, uh, and why do I think about it as a non-uniform version of small memory computation? I can think about the configuration graph of, of a small memory compu computation. Each layer is a time step, and at each layer, every node corresponds to a, one of the configurations of the machine. So W is essentially exponential in our memory. So if we're thinking about logarithmic amount of memory, W will be a polynomial. The length will also be polynomial. And we don't have any more input at this point. So we get this by hardwiring our input, and we only think about it as a computation over the random bits of that we read. Okay. So, so our log space computation has its input and also has random bits. So kind of you flip a coin, you can think about it as reading one random bit in a read once fashion. We are hardwiring the input, so this is already inside the machine. And all we do is read the bits and we, for example, if we want a pseudo random generator, we'll compare a uniform path with a path that follows our pseudo random bits. Good. Um, now, as I said, for RL, we have that W and N are a, a polynomial in the input length. And I'll just think about the input length as n, so, so we'll just think about n as x. And, and the situation is that when we do this transformation for a particular input, if the input is an accept input of the original computation, then half of the path from s will lead to t. If it's an input which is a reject input of the RL computation, then there is no path from S to T. So this, this is what we need to separate. Most of the path or half of the path lead to T and no path leads to T, okay? In BPL, we'll separate a case where two thirds of the path lead to T and one third of the path leads to T. So sometimes we want to approximate how many paths lead from S to T. But let's, uh, Let's kind of fixate on RL for a while. I just want to mention for those that are going to read papers inspired by this talk, that there is another very, very useful abstraction of log space computation, which comes in the form of approximating a, a matrix exponentiation. And I'll just, I mean, you can ignore the next couple of sentences, but, uh, but the way we can think about it Think about transition of one step. Think about the metrics that uh, represent this transition. What's the probability for going from this configuration to this in one step? The entire uh, path of computation is just, the probability is there, is just the exponentiation of this one step uh, moves. Uh, so this matrix, this basic matrix raised to the power of n. And th this 
turns out to be a useful obstruction, it's the same creature. Okay. So we're asking for RL, what's the memory needed to do it uh, deterministically? So what's the first result you can think of about RL? Right, you can definitely do it, right. Space, you can definitely uh, uh, go over all paths, uh, uh, but that of course will be too much exponential, so you'll be, uh, you'll be turning logarithmic space to perhaps polynomial space. Exactly, so that's perfect, that's exactly that. If you're not going to ask me questions, I'm going to ask you questions, so <laughs> it's a trade-off. Um, so, so Savage, Savage is a result about NL, but it, it's also a result about RL, right? So RL, is contained in NL, which is contained in L squared, log squared, log squared S space. And the reason I'm, I'm raising it is not, so I wasn't there, so I have no interest in going so far back, <laughs> but because this one basic idea that is in Savage has been following us through most of our work uh, on, on RL derandomization or even BPL. So what's the basic idea of Savage? Basic idea is, yeah, I cannot enumerate all paths, but I don't need to enumerate all paths. Because two paths that lead, for example, in the middle layer to the same node are exactly the same for me. I don't care how I got it as long as I can get there. So the enumeration that Savage does is saying, okay, let's look at the middle layer Let's enumerate all possible nodes that I can reach through. And then I'll ask, can you reach from the start vertex to this middle node? And can you reach from this middle node to the final uh, layer, to the accepted node? So in this, I'm enumerating essentially all paths, but in a smart way. I don't need, I don't need to distinguish two paths that are visiting the same node. And essentially, that's the basic thing about small memory computation. The basic thing is that a computation does not transmit too much information from any start point to the next. All you can transmit is the content of your memory, and this is small. And this will be a basic thing that we will see uh, we will see soon in the work on RL. Okay. So now let's see, okay, what this, did we start to contribute to this study after, after Savage? And that's this uh, thinking of oblivious derandomization through this notion of pseudorandom generators, which has uh, pseudorandom generators for small space as a, a strong local tra tradition here, as we'll see. So, so pseudorandom generators. That full small memory computations. I mentioned a lot of work in this talk partially because some of the people are in the audience, uh, but also, uh, but I also miss a lot of good work. Just to give you the feeling about the ideas that we're reaching now in the, in the three threads I'm going to talk about are based on so much beautiful research. So I don't want uh, um, kind of to forget that, but also to tell you that there are lots of ways to contribute to this research. Um, so we have AKS, 
I, I take home Lois Sam already. 87. Baba in Nissan. Segedi, 89. Nissan generator, that's definitely the most, probably the most famous of those. Nissan Zuckerman. INW, and Pagliazzo Nissan Vigerson. 94, and many more. But I think the Nissan generator and INW are, for, for the general case, they are still the best we have, in a sense. Or most, or I mean, there are some improvements, but almost, uh, this is almost as, be, as, as good as we can have it. So what, what is this notion of a, a pseudo-random generator? And I'm sure, I'm sure most of you, if, if not all of you are aware of it, but let me just draw the picture. So we have a way to take a short seed and transform it to a long string of length 10. And this string, this distribution, so when you put a uniform seed, you get a distribution over longer uh, strings. This distribution would fool whatever model of computation you want specifically to fool these run, read once uh, branching programs. Meaning that the probability of reaching from S to T will be essentially the same, almost the same, when you're using a uniform uh, path or when you're using the path, the distribution, a path following the distribution of the pseudorandom generator. So what do these results give? They give, as we'll see, seed which is order log n log wn over epsilon. So we already know what's W and N, the width and the length. And epsilon is how closely do you approximate this distribution? We say it's almost the same. It's actually off by at most epsilon. So if the probability here is half, then it will be half plus minus epsilon. Now, W and N are, so W is at most polynomial in N. Uh, so this gives you log squared N uh, seed length, which translates to a different argument that RL is in uh, L squared. So it, it doesn't give you an improvement already, but it played a major part, this notion, and these generators played a major part uh, in everything, I think, <laughs> or definitely in almost everything that happened later. In particular, this is also this also applies to BPL. So the two-sided version. Um, it's a major tool in the study. In particular, it's a major tool in in the almost best result about de-randomization of, uh, of RL, so that's Zach Zhu, 95, which RL is in L to the 3 half. It's a tiny improvement over that, but that's where we stuck on this front. And uh, I wish I could tell you, I mean, this is one of my favorite results, both for actual reasons and sentimental reasons. <laughs> this was my first conference that I, I attended. Um, there was some hope when it happened that now the next step would be RL in four, four third, L to the four thirds, up to L to the one plus epsilon. This still didn't happen, so that's the first open question. RL to the L to the four thirds. Can we do that? And, and one of the threads that I'm going to discuss 
can be thought of as a step towards this goal. Uh, in particular, if we could do a pseudo-random generator that would match this bound, we can actually, so this is a result that you can de-randomize in log to the three halves, but if you had a, a generator that had seed L log to the three halves, then you could improve this result, just use it again recursively, and so on. In general, beyond, okay, so I said it applies to BPL, it's useful as a tool, and it has applications beyond RL. Uh, so the pseudo-random generators, these are very strong de-randomization tools. And uh, for example, a beautiful result by Indic, another by Siva Kumar, and quite a few other things. There are things that we could do very easily if we had uh, good generators for small space computation. So an open question is to reduce the seed, get seed length little o of log squared, which would Im improve also this result. Uh, until recently, this was not known even uh, for w equals three. One of the things I'm going to tell you is that now we can do that, but it's still completely open for, or at least it's still open for w equals four. There are a few hours till I end this talk. Perhaps there will be an announcement at the end, I don't know. Uh, but for w equals four, we still don't have uh, a generator that has seed less than log squared. So you can get the entire polynomial width with the same cost that you can do deal with width for ranging problems. I, I couldn't hear you. Uh, not that I'm aware of. I think you're probably referring <laughs> <laughs> to Barrington's uh, result, but I don't know that it does translate in this way. Right, there is the read once aspect of things. Yeah. But it does show us that these constant widths can do very, very surprising things. So these are not, uh, and even with uh, three generalized lots of interesting things we like to de-randomize. Um, so, so let me tell you something about uh, the technique of these techniques of these generators, and then I'll be able to move to our first uh, thread. And the basic idea, again, as I said, in all of these generators, is exactly the one from Savage, which is there is limited information that is transmitted from any first part of a computation to, to later on. Um, and, uh, and in fact, in terms of pseudo-random generators, that was the only kind of technique we had until very recently. And we'll see at the end a very, very different generator uh, that works even for polynomial width. It, do, it still doesn't improve a, a Nissan, but as pol polylogarithmic seed length and is completely different than the technique that I'm going to tell you now. And I'm going to, uh, to describe it using uh, extract randomness extractors, uh, uh, which is like Nissan Zuckerman was, uh, was described uh, for a uh, Nissan it was described with, uh, with pairwise independent hash functions, I and W with expander graphs. I'll describe everything using extractors. Uh, I think in some sense this is the most intuitive uh, way of thinking about it. So let's say that we have a log space computation A and it's reading 
x. So it's reading a string x, which is completely uniform, and has one angret log n bits. Now when it ended reading it, a is in a state s. This state tells you something about x. Usually it doesn't tell you too much, unless s is very, very unlikely. Uh, this will tell you essentially log n bits. On average, it will tell you log n bits about x. This means in terms of entropy or mean entropy that x conditioned on s has essentially 99 log n bits of entropy. And you can, I mean, if you give up a few more logs, it will also happen not on average, but with good enough probability. What does it mean? It means that now we can invest a few more bits and extract this randomness. So now I can let A continue its computation on a string that's almost as long, which is an extractor, a randomness extractor, applied to x, and a short random string y. This string, because it extracts the randomness in x conditioned on s, this will give me a string which is close to being uniform, even conditioned on s. And S is the entire thing the computation relies on. So at this point, the computation starts from S and, and goes over a string which is almost uniform conditioned on the current state. So the computation continues as it should. The state that will reach here distri is distributed as it should. Right? So this gives me a very basic generator not a huge generator, but almost one that almost doubles my input, which is the generator that takes x, y, and turns it into x concatenated with the extractor applied on x, y. So we just argued that this is a pseudo-random generator uh, that fools small memory computation, log memory computation, okay? Once you believe that, now you can, I mean, this is a very primitive thing, but once you can you believe that, you can do lots of nice things. For example, you have the Nissen-Zuckerman generator that will take x, y1, y2, up to some ya, and translate it to, as you can guess, x concatenated with the extractor applied to x and y1, concatenated with the extractor on x and y2, and so on. Now let's look at possible choice of parameters. We can have x, we should have x be an order log n bits string, like we had in that example. We can have each yi be order log uh, to the half n bit long, so kind of square root of log n. And this means that if we want a seed which is order log n, we can afford a, a to have quite a few strings. So a can be also order log to the one half n. Okay. So this expands by now. That one over there expanded by a factor of two. This, pa this one expands log n bits, order log n, to 
log to the three halves. N. And recursively, we can expand uh, to any polylog n bits. So Nissan Zuckerman shows how you can, if your log space computation only uses polylogarithmic amount of bits, you can completely de randomize it. Um, AKS, by the way, shows how to expand from log to log squared with error one over n. This error would not be as strong. This error would be, as I presented it, will be two to the minus log square root of log n. So two open questions here. Is uh, any polylog expansion with error one over n and the uh, super polyno polynomial expansion or super polynomial expansion uh, with, with the constant error. So both of these are open. Uh, there, is, there, there is some partial result here uh, that was joined with run ras. Yes. Uh, so just on our first question, so I guess uh, you mentioned the AKS result. Right. Uh, that does this for up to like log squared roughly, uh, but, but only in the, in the hitting the generator. That's the, the example that was. Okay. I have confirmation that, yeah. Right. The first problem has this result. Right, right. And we, we yeah. yeah right. In the pseudo random generator setting. Right. Also Absolutely. We, we are going to talk about that actually. But AI, you know, everything that happened before your time is kind of meshed. <laughs> okay. So now let me talk about Let me talk about I and W, which actually, if you already believed me for Nissan Zuckerman, it's just kind of you flip uh, I and W, of course, uh, anachronistically flips Nissan Zuckerman on, on its side. I mean, Nissan Zuckerman followed Nissan, which already has this property, but. So Nissan and Nissan uh, Zuckerman, just a very recursive version of that. Think of now of a tree. At the top of the tree, I'll put here this x, y, which are uniform, meaning that x is uniform. Now I recursively construct some generator that produced to me n over two bits. And I want to construct another n over two bits. What would I use to do this recursively? I'll use an extractor applied on x, y. And now construct this recursively. And the argument will be the same. Because this is recursively a pseudo-random generator, then this behavior, this behaves like a random computation. This the distribution of uh, the state you reach here is the right distribution. And condition on the state you reach here, you didn't learn too much about x. It's still a high entropy source, which you can extract the, the entropy. And now you have a seed that is independent of your state, and you can recursively construct another 
to the random generator that will work again based on the recursive analysis. Okay. So what's the seed length? For knowing the seed length, we need to understand how much are we losing at every step of the computation, at every level. And we're going to use to have two kinds of losses. I mean, we lose log n, but there are two reasons why we're losing this log n. So let me separate the two losses. One loss is, um, so first, log n at each level, uh, because of the entropy of the state. So I said, given the state here, this is still a high entropy uh, source, but it's not as high as the, as, as the length. We lost some entropy. We lost the length of the seed. We lost log n bits because, sorry, the state, because the state told us log, potentially told us log n bits of information about the seed. So this is one loss, which is the state at each level. The other one is the loss of y, the seed of the, the, seed of the generator, of the extractor. So the, the other loss is the seed of the extractor. And this is essentially log of one over epsilon prime, where epsilon prime is epsilon over n. Okay, so you want a generator that will be close up to epsilon. You're going to apply these extractors many, many times. You'll apply them about n times. And these errors that you're going to have will accumulate. Therefore, uh, you need to work with a much smaller epsilon at each uh, step, which is uh, epsilon over n. And this means that this loss is also logarithmic in n. So for two different reasons, you're going to have losses which are logarithmic uh, in n. Uh, there is a generator that interpolate Nissan and uh, INW. Just for the record, uh, it's a generator by uh, Armoni. And using that within uh, uh, Zaxu gives you a slight improvement over L, RL in L to the three halves. It's RL in L to the three halves over log, uh, square root of log L. That's what I, I managed to gather. Okay, let me briefly talk about, um, kind of to complete this part, briefly talk about various ways in which we could try to improve INW. As I said, at the end of the talk, uh, at the end of the lecture, the second part, we look at a completely different approach, uh, a different generator, so it will give us different ways of approaching our L equals L. Uh, but kind of briefly, and especially because it's going to factor in the, the first two threads of our discussion, or even the three threads of the discussion, let me say, okay, if that's the only way we believe we can construct generators for small space, but we still believe that we want a seed which is logarithmic rather than log squared, then uh, how can we hope to get it? So, so we need to so kind of get rid of the, lo of the two kinds of losses. First, the loss that has to do with uh, the entropy of the state. So one thing is that this loss is not too bad if we're only thinking about W, which is constant. For W, which is order one, this loss doesn't bother us too much, right? It's just a constant. 
And in fact, this plays a part in many of the work on constant width branching programs. Another kind of the one way of attacking it that I'm aware of in the general case is again from that work with the run runs that I mentioned, which, which tries to say, okay, this state really costs you some entropy, uh, some entropy loss, but can you recycle this entropy in a later stage of the computation? There is a partial effort towards that. It works under some assumptions, some assumption about knowing something about the probability of states, uh, but it's, it's an interesting direction. Can you recycle the entropy of the states? The other question is to deal with this loss, the loss of the seed, which is a log of one over epsilon prime, which mainly is caused by these epsilons kind of accumulating. And I want to mention a few things that you can try to do without saying much about, about them. You can use perhaps seedless extractors. I mean, this is not, these are not results. These are hopes or possible directions. Perhaps you don't even need a seed. Who said you need a seed? Extraction can happen at times without a seed. Perhaps you are using a seed, but perhaps can you recycle the seed? Perhaps you can do things that we managed to do in other areas, like in the construction of extractors, which is some kind of error reduction. Instead of working with a very pessimistic level of error, work with error that's large, but at each point kind of reduce it as you need, as you go along. A right. And actually, the first thread will really show us something about maintaining the error, the right level of error. So it will be interesting. There's something think at least something intuitively that connects for me with this. And finally, I want to make an observation that if you use epsilon prime, which is epsilon over log n, rather than over n, you already get something that's useful, or at least not ridiculous. So if you do epsilon prime, which is epsilon over log n, then you cannot say that errors don't accumulate over the entire tree. But you can say that errors don't accumulate too, well, too much over any particular path of the tree. And this means that this generator with a high, ep high epsilon, kind of not the epsilon you should work with, gives you a sequence which is not so random, but is unpredictable. If your entire purpose in life is to read i bits of the generator and predict the i plus one bit, then you cannot do it beyond epsilon. But since you, to make it useful, you won't work with final epsilon, which is one over n, then you cannot use i bit argument to say, okay, now you're so random. So you have a sequence which is unpredictable but not so random. And the question is, is it usable at all? And there are cases where, I, where it is usable. So, so for the question of is it usable, I'll say yes for undirected connectivity. which was proved in the work of Rosenman and Vadan. So if you walk on an undirected graph with such a sequence, you're still good enough. Because in some sense, for undirected connectivity, you can never get stuck. You can make small mistakes, but you can always recover from them. And it is also correct 
for some constant with uh, branching programs. So particularly for regular, for example, constant with branching program from the work of uh, Braverman, Raz, Rao, Raz, and Udayov, you can see that essentially this kind of generator, although it's kind of uh, not doing what it should, it's still good enough uh, for constant uh, memory computation. And that's related to a, a strong understanding of how error accumulates uh, or how influences or impacts are accumulated in a small memory co uh, computation, constant with computation, and they don't accumulate as bad as, as they could. Yes? What fed on the replicas? Sorry? What fed on the replicas? What fell? are for directed connectivity. Uh, because, um, right, we know that, that, that walks with a little bit of bias can actually drift. And if this drifting eventually stuck you in kind of a hole, but for, undirect, for directed connectivity, if you're doing a few bad things that accumulate kind of in n steps, in square root n step, you're kind of moving more and more to the right until you Teach it, eat a sink, and you're you're done. And if the reversibility of of things saves you. Okay, so so these are all the this is all the context I wanted to tell you uh, before we look at the at the first three threads. And I mean these tools are very useful to a lot of what these threads are made of. So my hope is to tell you the first thread in the first part and tell, tell you something about the next two threads in the second part of this tutorial. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about two results. The authors of one of the results are here. They can jump in. I already asked Sumega to jump in if I, uh, if I make any mistakes. So the first one is to improve the dependence on the epsilon. Our seed when you think just about epsilon, it has a factor of log n times log one over epsilon. This means that even if epsilon is much smaller than one over n, then you won't be kind of optimal with respect to, uh, to epsilon because you'll have this log n attached to it. And we have in the work of Braverman Cohen and a uh, Sumega Garak. A heating set generator plus plus. And it, actually the one thing I want to tell you more than anything, and I'll focus is what is this plus plus means. That's perhaps the one of the things that are the most intriguing and exciting towards possible future work. Uh, with seed length, O tilde of log WK log N plus log one over epsilon. So the dependence on n and the width doesn't really improve. The dependence on log one over epsilon up to this O theta thing is much better. What's k? Uh, k is my version of n. Thank you. And there is another result, a follow-up by Hosa and uh, Zuckerman.
which has, a, I mean, the emphasis is the simplicity. It's, it's much simpler. The analysis is much simpler. The parameters are also a bit better. There isn't the O tilde. And there is another factor, so log Wn times log n, as before, over something that I don't even want to write, because usually it won't give you much. Uh, it's a little bit related to the harmonic thing that I mentioned in passing, plus log 1 over epsilon. But this is really a heating set generator. I didn't even say at any point what a heating set generator is, so I should. Uh, a pseudo-random generator is such that the probability of reaching from the start to the end is uh, to accept is almost the right probability. A heating set generator, more appropriate to de-randomizing RL, uh, would be such that if there are enough paths if there is epsilon fraction of the path leads from S to T to accept, then we'll find at least one of them. So the generator will provide us with various kind of strings. One of them will reach accept. The eating set generator plus plus, technically one of its advantages is that it also helps us to de-randomize two-sided error, so BPL. So uh, let me briefly say something about this one and then focus a little bit about what is this plus plus uh, thing. And then I will have to let you go and take all the risks that are involved with that. <laughs> so. so, Oza Zuckerman are telling us something interesting about computation, about this kind of branching program computation. They're telling us that if I look at this computation, at this branching program, and I look at any vertex v, that has some probability of reaching uh, t, reaching accept, then there is some future step I don't know when, could be even here. But let's say here. And there is a subset of these vertices, a subset S of the vertices of some future layer with the following two properties. First, the probability to reach from V to S is not too small, it's at least two, uh, two over n squared. There is a polynomial probability of hitting, if you start a, a walk from V, there's some probability of hitting this set S. And the probability for every vertex in S of reaching except uh, of, so for every U in S, the probability of u reaching except is larger than the probability when we start from v. So we have gained some progress. It is at least n over 4, the probability of reaching except from v. Now, the point is that if you only look at this part of the computation from here to here, and you want to de-randomize it, and to de-randomize it just in the sense of having a path reaching this S, you don't need to work with the tiny epsilon. It's enough to work with epsilon, which is polynomial, 2 to the n over 2 to the n squared. Because if you have a generator that has this error, then it is guaranteed to find at least one, one, one kind of path from V to S. So essentially, the entire construction that they, they have 
is built on the fact that you can divide the computation into not too many parts. So the entire computation from, from S to T to not too many parts, some are long, some are short, such that each one of them asks you to hit something that happens with probability which is polynomial, not tiny, not epsilon, and you don't have too many of those. So combining a task that reaching from S to T, although, S, although this may happen with tiny probability epsilon, can be divided to many tasks that, are, that work with a reasonable epsilon. And I think that's all I want to say about that. Yeah, 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 sure. So the inequality, I guess, that you wanted uh, uh, comparing to one or something. Like right, that. right. So, yeah, so this may be <laughs> more than one. And then in that case, you are just reaching t. So then s will just be t, and you have probability, uh, reasonable probability of just eating t. So let's say, uh, assuming that the probability from V to reach T is smaller than, uh, than uh, if it's already larger than N, 2 over N squared, you already can reach all, all the way to T. That's the last one. So now, let me tell you about the notion that I find very intriguing and I wonder if it can have applications either in this study or perhaps in some other pseudorandomness uh, context of pseudorandom pseudo distributions. So in a standard pseudorandom generator We have our seed. That is, let's say, of, of length L, L bits. And it produces Z. Some output Z, which is N bits. And then it's a pseudorandom generator if the fraction of seeds that reach except uh, of, of strings that you produce that reach from S to T is the right fraction. But in this work, uh, uh, they introduce this notion of a pseudo distribution. A pseudo distribution has strings that have positive probability, or I mean, I want to think about it as probability. So let's kind of imagine that we call it positive probabilities and negative probabilities. So more formally, beyond the string that you produce, you also produce row, which is a real number. And this gives you a distribution, or a pseudo distribution, d tilde, on these pairs of row one, z one, up to row uh, 2 to the L, Z to the L. And we, we said that it is a pseudo, it is, it's pseudo random. So this pseudo distribution is pseudo random. Uh, if for every machine in the class that we want to fool, uh, the sum of these uh, row i's for everything where the machine accepts, for every zi that wh where you're supposed to accept, is essentially up to epsilon the probability that the machine accepts over the uniform distribution. So just kind of for sanity, what would this mean for just a pseudorandom generator. You can imagine that the pseudorandom generator produces strings as it does. And 
it also produces real numbers, and all of these real numbers are just one over two to the n, just one over the number of strings. And then this, this sum is just the probability you're accepting uh, over, right, over the output of the pseudo-random generator. So we are generalizing it by allowing you to have things that makes you accept and things that make you kind of, uh, that you need to, things that gives you positive probability of acceptance and things that kind of tell you, okay, you need to reduce this probability a little bit based on whether these numbers are positive or negative. Sorry? Um, these, these rows, uh, uh, I don't think that they, sh they need to be, do they need to be? Okay. That's correct. Okay, so let me, let's see how much time do I have. Seven minutes to tell you why these kind of things have any reason to occur, any kind of usefulness. I'm not going to get into the entire structure of the proof for reasons uh, that should be So right, so a pseudo distribution is this collection of, uh, of strings and real numbers. In the distribution, all of these real numbers are probabilities from zero to one and they sum to one. Here too, they will sum essentially to one, but some of them will be positive, some of them will be negative. And now when I'm calculating and I'm thinking, okay, what's the probability the machine accepts uh, this pseudo, uh, on this pseudo distribution? I'm, I'm looking at all the, the, real, the positive real numbers and I sum them for strings that are accepting, but I also reduce uh, all the negative ones uh, for f when you are accepting. So I look at all the strings for which you're accepting and sum the, these weights. Some of them will add, some of them will reduce. Okay, so I think the kind of, okay, so I, I've developed these two, well, I developed one abstraction and I stole from Sumega another abstraction that kind of should help to understand how come it could be uh, useful. It gives you more freedom, but uh, oh, oh, yeah, okay, great. That that is something I wanted to say, and the other one I'll say in a second. So, so how would you use it? So, one thing that you want that I want to argue is that kind of if you remove the weights, then this is already a eating set generator because. Um, Right, this sum should be, let's say, let's say you had epsilon fraction, this sum should be epsilon. This one of these strings should have some positive real, uh, real number. So that's one thing. But in fact, it will also help you, I mean, you can just uh, calculate it. You can enumerate over all seeds, calculate this, and you get a good approximation of the probability of acceptance, which means that you can actually also solve BPL you can solve two-sided error with this kind of thing. So it immediately gives you a eating set generator, but with some ad uh, additional power that allows you to also address two-sided. Uh, so there's, there's some restriction on the size of the eating Right, so, so I guess because there are not too many of those, you pr probably don't need to the answer is probably yes in the construction and, and potentially you can, you can reduce to that. I mean, you can may, perhaps you can even make it without loss of generality, but definitely yes, in the construction, yeah, you don't have, uh, right. 
Absolutely, yes. yes. That's correct. I mean, in general, this generator itself has to be small memory, and therefore it cannot produce even ways that are too large. But OK. So. so, so yes, so why is it useful? And in some cases, almost as useful as a pseudo-random generator. Uh, we've seen, but why, why would it make it easier? So here is an abstraction that I take full responsibility for. But I think it captures something in the construction. And so, so let's try to do the IMW thing, which means you create something for the left and create something for the right, right? So you create a distribution over n over two bits and another distribution over n over two and now you're going to combine them. Now, assume you have a way of creating these samples that of strings of just n over two bits. You have a way to create a sample st a of size t of strings of length n over two that approximate roughly approximates a uniform strings. So if you look at branching programs that only read n over two bits, this distribution st would be good enough, would, would be a pseudo-random. And of course it can also be pseudo-distribution pseudo kind of in, in, but even let's start with the case where this is pseudo-random to begin with. Let's view this, so and the property is that the larger this sample is, the larger t is, the larger the sample is, but also, uh, the better the approximation is. So let's look at ST and view it as ST minus ST over 2 plus ST over 2 minus ST over 4 plus all the way up to some basic SG. So the one before that will be S2G minus SG. So this is just the same thing. This is just ST. But now I have strings that are positive and strings that are negative. Furthermore, I, can let, I, I wrote it this way. So we look at each row. And we see that this, this thing gives you a very crude approximation. And with every row, you are improving this approximation. So that's one thing. The, the, the more you go forward, the better the approximation is. And also, in terms of the magnitude of your correction, what happens is that this, for example, the last one is a very small correction. Because ST is a good approximation, gives you a good approximation of the acceptance probability. But S over T over 2 is also by now a very good approximation. So these are two very good approximations of the same thing. The probability of wh when you look at the machine on the strings of ST, and the probability when you look at the machine of, uh, on string of ST over 2, these are two probabilities that are very close to each other. So the correction here is very, very small. So you somehow divided this general correction that's, that's very good into something that's very crude and a sequence of improvements that are getting better and better. In mean, analogy, you can think about exclusion inclusion, right? You're getting better and better. And now, the point is, and th this is where I'll use another abs abstraction, I think that it captures something. I'll, I'll ask to again in the break, but I think it captures something in the proof, or a major part in the proof. The question is, okay, what, what does it help you? I mean, you can just use ST. It helps you now when you're combining both of them. You have ST for the left and some S prime T for the right. You're going to combine them. To combine them, you're going to combine terms from here and terms from here. 
A and the point is that these terms that give you very, very small corrections are perhaps still necessary. You need these small corrections. But now when you take a term that is a small correction on the left and another one that gives you a small correction on the right, by now this is a tiny cor a correction that you don't need to maintain anymore. So it helps you shed off through the rounds of recursion corrections that are too fine-grained. So it helps you maintain the right level of approximation. And this is where uh, the analogy is to, um, to just uh, the product of two numbers. So let's say you want to look at the product of 23.562 and 41.259. This product is a combination of 25 products, right? Uh, two times four, but also two times 0 0.009, uh, and so on. Now, if you want to have approximation that's good up to this point, you, you cannot, at this point already, kind of uh, get rid of the 0 0.2 or the 0 0.6. Because these are still important. But now when you multiply both, perhaps the terms that correspond to 0 0.02 times 0 0.09 by now are so tiny that are, they are not important for the future. Okay, so that's the entire intuition I have. Uh, if you want to hear more, uh, ask uh, Sumega and Mark in the break. And I uh, hope to see you in the second part.